I suppose it is my duty in contributing to this series of talks to discuss why a man of Newman's particular temperament should have changed his spiritual allegiance under the conditions of a particular moment in history. I am at a disadvantage as being one who thinks that everybody who is in Newman's position, whatever be his temperament, ought to do what Newman did, no matter at what moment in history. But I will try to stick to my brief. I know many people will say I have got him wrong. But then, <coughs> Newman is one of those few people who have really opened their hearts to posterity. St. Paul and Dr. Johnson are in the same category. So that every fool thinks his Newman is the right one. Cor ad cor loquitur was his motto, and he must be content to be at the mercy of the receiving instrument. The Oxford movement began as a spiritual reaction to a political stimulus, and a reaction in the fullest sense. It is no good pretending that the first Tractarians were not reactionaries. The whole situation which led up to the Reform Bill was seen by them and condemned by them as liberalism. The intellectual challenge to Christianity, as we know it, had hardly begun. They lived in a world less than 6,000 years old. Hints of an immemorial antiquity had been found a few years earlier in Kemp's cavern, but the man who discovered them, a Catholic priest, a Father McEnery, was universally disbelieved. The origin of species did not appear till twenty years later. Destructive criticism of the Bible was becoming fashionable in Germany, but only well-informed men like Hugh Rose had yet heard of it. The utilitarianism of Bentham and Mill was the enemy, but this was seen as part of a general infiltration into England of Jacobin ideas, which the world at large called liberalism and Newman called Antichrist. Its most dreadful triumph, curiously, had been Catholic emancipation. Newman voted with gusto against the re-election of Sir Robert Peel and wrote home to his mother, we have proved the independence of the church and of Oxford. The suppression of ten Irish bishoprics put a match to the train of orthodox revolt and Keebor preached his sermon on national apostasy. To meet the attack, Oxford and through Oxford, England, must be kept safe as the preserve of Anglicanism. The old-fashioned high churchmen, the two-bottle orthodox, could not be entrusted with such a task. The Church of England must be taught to realize herself as a spiritual body, as a tree of independent growth, not a climbing plant which would come down among the ruins of the body politic when Jacobinism should triumph. How Newman, an evangelical at the roots of him, and a liberal by his early training, came to throw in his lot with the party of reaction, is, humanly speaking, a mystery, not solved for us by the Apologia or by Church's history of the movement. Most probably it was due to the personal influence of Harold Froude, that infinitely attractive enfant terrible uh, who so charmed and dazzled and shocked his contemporaries. The man whose early death sets one's mind aching with the problem, what line would he have taken in 1845? Whatever the reason for it, Newman threw himself heart and soul into the cause, that infinitely sensitive heart that scrupulously disciplined so. During the years of the Oxford movement proper, from 1833 to 1845, his figure 
so dominated and dominate the scene that you are tempted to say he was the Oxford movement. From 1833 to 1845, strange that the passage of a dozen years should feel so long. Yet in our own century, the corresponding years mark the whole period between Hitler's accession to power and Hitler's death. The Assize Sermon, the Tracts for the Times, the Preaching at St. Mary's, Hamden's Professorship, the Martyr's Memorial, the attack on Pusey, Ward's ideal of a Christian church and the condemnation of it, all this falls within the narrow space of those twelve years. And the process ended, so far as the direct object of the movement was concerned, in a defeat. Instead of safeguarding the monopoly of Anglicanism in Oxford, it precipitated the secularization of the university. In Tract 90, Newman was at pains to show that all his beliefs were reconcilable with the doctrine of the 39 Articles, and was widely denounced for his insincerity. W. G. Ward, who was later to be the author of that inimitable phrase, shall I deny the fact or defend the principle? Ward was emboldened to take a more drastic line than his master. He admitted that he could not justify his views by a natural interpretation of the articles. But then, uh, could any of the liberals in Oxford justify theirs? It was the hot-headedness of a born logician, not any instinct of sabotage, that led him thus to drive a wedge between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But the effect was to discredit the articles as a basis of subscription. And the removal of tests, which was doubtless bound to come, came all the earlier for this unexpected attack. Meanwhile, Newman was on his Anglican deathbed in retirement at Littlemore. It has been customary to exclaim at the short-sightedness, the want of statesmanship on the part of the Anglican authorities which drove him to such a step. If only they had tried to understand what the Tractarians really meant. But such explanations are psychologically unsound. And to a man like Dean Church, puzzled by the vagaries of conscience which led him to part from Newman at the crossroads, O oh, hard destiny, except that the all-merciful so willed it that such companions might not walk in the house of God as friends. But to a man like Church, it seemed necessary to suppose that the mind of his leader had somehow been wrought upon. But in fact, Newman had seen a ghost. It was not anything which happened in the 19th century. It was the theological controversies of the 5th century that were exercising him. Had there ever been, effectively, a universal church without a pope? That question fatally disturbed the, ba the balance with which he trod the Via Media. Once your balance has been lost, disturbances from without count for nothing. The confidence which has been shaken is irrecoverable. So, a man who is kept awake by indigestion will blame the financial worries which haunt his mind as the cause of his insomnia. But it is a false diagnosis. It can be maintained more plausibly that although Newman may not have been pushed over the line by his opponents, he was nevertheless pulled over it by his friends. It is true that he was always somewhat at the mercy of disciples who thought they saw the way more clearly than he did. Faber and Dalgans before his conversion, Simpson and Acton after it. But in the first place, it is not always a bad thing at moments of decision to have others dependent on you. 
it is sometimes easier to see what is the right course uh, for another person than for yourself. And in the second place, if personal motives beckoned Newman in the direction he took, how much stronger were the personal ties that held him back? No, if ever a deliberate step was taken, it was the step Newman took in 1845. Criticize, if you will, the decision he made, but do not doubt that his whole self went to the making of it. Newman himself has described that older Catholic world into which he graduated as a race that shunned the light. Perhaps all that would have changed as the result of emancipation, even without Newman. But I think that as the result of his conversion, his co-religionists became more alive to the questions that were being agitated in the world around them, the questions with which this series of talks mainly deals. Hitherto, the Catholic body had been sealed off from its surroundings. And the church itself, as Wilfrid Ward has pointed out, suffered at that moment from an indifference uh, to apologetic. I did not realize the difficulty of putting its message across. In England, at least, Newman sensitized it. We could not go on in happy indifference uh, to what was being said by Darwin, what was being said in essays and reviews. We were braced up beforehand to meet the challenge of modernism, which came with the dawn of the 20th century. Nobody, I imagine, would claim that Newman's personal influence was as great after his conversion as before it. His preaching, his writings, appealed to thousands of minds, thousands of souls. He had a vast correspondence that he was no longer at the head of an army. It was not only that he had cut himself off from the main stream of the national life, thrown in his lot with a minority, at that time an almost unregarded minority. He moreover consecrated himself to God's service in an institute which, gracious and consoling as are its traditions, makes for immobility. Your oratorium cultivates no less than your Benedictine the love of his own room. His is an active vocation, and but the parishioners of a single district have the first claim on him. He is no student of Bradshaw. There are, of course, the high spots in Newman's life, the Achille trial, uh, the, apol the apologia, uh, the cardinalate. But more and more as it went on, his life was a hidden life. He meant it to be. Naturally, there was a constant agitation among his friends and admirers to bring him out into the limelight. The unfortunate issue of those attempts is notorious. Whether the unimaginative and sometimes unintelligible attitude of his superiors is wholly to blame, admits of doubt. It may be doubted, I mean, whether a position could have really been found in that age for a priest of those talents who exercised his talents with full advantage. The Irish university scheme, beyond question, was bungled. But if it had been handled perfectly, would it have succeeded? Neither Baines's attempt at Prior Park nor Manning's at Hammersmith encourages the belief. It is arguable that the whole scheme was too ambitious. Translating the Bible would have been a congenial task, but it is no recipe for securing popularity among your co-religionists. No, if there was any scheme that really held out hopes, it was that of sending Newman back to Oxford. What would have happened? 
What would have happened if Newman and Jowett had faced one another across St. Giles's? If there had been any religious figure in Oxford these last 40 years with a tenth of Newman's influence, we might have some material for guessing. Curiously, his influence belongs to our age rather than to his own. We, who are so apt to throw mud at the portraits of our grandfathers, refrain somehow when it comes to Newman. We do not count him as part of that offensively prosperous world on whose prizes he deliberately turned his back. But that is not all. Among his co-religionists in all the English-speaking countries, I think his fame stands higher today than it did half a century back. He, who so divided Catholic sympathies in his lifetime, unites them now that he is dead. He has become the symbol of a living aspiration. But among the Victorians, he does not fit in. Others of the Oxford converts enjoyed proportionately more reclam. Manning, as the typical embodiment of an ecclesiastic, Faber, as a born revivalist, Ward, in the incredible role of a seminary professor who came in for money. Only Manning, perhaps, achieved national importance History will at least remember the octogenarian who settled the dock strike of 1889. It is not easy to determine how much of Catholic progress in the 50 years that followed emancipation is due to the conversions, how much to the rise of an Anglo-Irish body as the result of the potato famine. The Irish question itself it does not, I think, fall within the scope of this talk. More and more it came to be seen as a racial, not a religious issue. Apart from that, did the Catholic body in England leave much mark on the history of the Victorian age? On its gossip columns, yes. We were in the news all the time whether it were Lord Bute supplying the title role for Lothair or the Titchborne family fighting the Titchborne claimant. But when you have drawn up an imposing list of comparatively eminent Victorians who were also Catholics, you have not proved that their influence would have told differently if they had belonged to a different faith. And did Catholicism as such leave its mark on the annals of the day before yesterday? The answer to that question is commonly forgotten, if only because the people concerned are not and were not in the habit of drawing attention to themselves. The really amazing thing those ancestors of ours did was to cover the whole of England with a network of charitable institutions, schools, hospitals, orphanages, rescue homes, and so on, almost entirely staffed by nuns. Whatever else we forget about the Victorians, let us remember the enormous voluntary effort they made to heal the wounds of a laissez-faire civilization. It has been largely replaced in our own day by those social services which are its parricidal progeny. But in its time, it kept things going while the state did nothing. And Catholics, in proportion to their number and resources, did more than their share. Our English convents, may have been founded originally from France. They may recruit uh, to some extent from Ireland, but they are part of us. And if you could reckon up the volume of non-power exercised, the number 
of nine hours spent between 1845 and the Diamond Jubilee. What a staggering total it would make. It accompanies with a music not of this world, the story of our irrecoverable past.